Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Ali Houston is a health coach, food innovator, scientist, and engineer who helps people to be healthy while enjoying great food. Ali has struggled with weight, cancer, and mental health problems, including anxiety and ADHD diagnoses. He fixed his health by changing how he ate and was amazed with his results. Ali changed his diet in 2015 after a physics professor introduced him to the paleo diet, which he treated with suspicion, but eventually decided that it made sense to him scientifically. After doing much reading and research, Ali decided that eating low carbohydrate would be very, extremely healthy and would prove to be a great way to heal his metabolic and autoimmune conditions. Ali noticed a difference straight away and was so amazed that he started his own company in 2017 called Paleo Canteen. Ali is the co-author of the cookbook, Paleo Canteen, Low Carb on a Budget, the Easy Weight Loss Low Carb Cookbook, which includes a foreword by our former podcast guest, Dr. David Unwin. In addition, he is a prolific podcaster as the host of the Ali Houston Transforms podcast by Paleo Canteen, which is how I found Ali in his great work, having shared many venerable guests on our shows. Ali Houston, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you so much for having me on, Casey. Absolutely. It's an interesting accent for somebody that has the last name of Houston. Yeah, I think there's not one route for it because anyone who was called Hughes, who started a town, sometimes ended up taking the name Houston. Um, but it's quite common in Scotland. It, I think there's something like one in, about one in 500, or, um, give or take, people are actually called, their surname is Houston. And it's very common in Northern Ireland as well. And um, yeah, then, you know, depending on who you listen to, the uh, some of the, the, the Protestants went over to uh, the United States, um, as it's called now, uh, the new land, and settled in places like Virginia. And, you know, they would wear these little red neckerchiefs. And that, so that's why they were called rednecks. And... Um, they, uh, they, they ended up spreading all over um, the South. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's said that I'm somehow distantly related to Sam Houston, who um, was governor of Texas uh, through that Scottish line. That is incredible. Dude, we're only three minutes in, and I've already learned something completely unexpected. <laughs> You're so well read and I love your podcast. Like I mentioned, you're such a great host. Of course you would know that. I would assume my last name is Ruff. I would assume there were tons more Ruffs in Scotland than there would be Houston's. I did not know any of that. That's fascinating. The other one is um, that the uh, the Protestants were a big uh, proponents of King William of Orange who'd fought uh, against the Catholics, but so somehow for the Pope. I don't know the full story about it, but um, they were called Billy Boys, the people, the, the Protestants in, in Ireland who were in favour of, of King William of Orange. And so they became the hillbillies when they went over. So hillbillies and rednecks really come from that um, Northern Irish kind of Ulster Scots Protestant line, um, rather than anything about what happened in the States. It's, it's mad, isn't it? That is crazy. I did not know any of that. I really appreciate that. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and information with us. I thought it was funny. I've heard you on another podcast reference the two seasons that Scotland has. Which season are you currently experiencing? Yeah, we're just coming out of winter. And, and uh, the, uh, the comedian Billy Connolly said Scotland has two seasons, winter and June. And <laughs> um, he's, he's pretty accurate with that, like he is with, with many things. Um, so... Yeah, I'm actually, I'm moving to England soon, but um, it's, it's very similar there as well. Famous for the rain. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can tell you being around here. So I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, just outside of Salt Lake. And, you know, I don't ever really get affected by seasonal depression of any kind. I usually feel pretty good. We're in the desert. And so even in winter, we normally have sunny days. We've had absolute record snow here. Most of the winter has been very, very gray and, and, and kind of bleak right now. It's cloudy outside. And I can tell you, I have been very much affected by not seeing the sunlight very much, not, not, not as much as normal. Normally, I've got a great base tan at this time of year. I don't have one now. And boy, it's really affecting my mental health. How do you guys deal with that there? Yeah, well, um, it's a good question. And I'm not sure that we deal with it very well, to be honest. The, you know, there's, there's a, a reasonable association between all cause mortality and latitude. You know, if you if you dig into the the stats, um, 
I th- I, you know, the 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 the, the, the positive effects that sunlight have on health I think are well established even if they're misrepresented and the sun is said to be um, more dangerous than it is um, especially when people you know make, make a point to never burn if you're very careful not to burn then I don't see where the danger is and I can certainly see where the the huge benefits are and um, it's it's actually quite difficult to get UV light in Scotland uh, or in most of the UK for half of the year, really, because it just doesn't get through. So um, from about April till uh, September, I get out in the sun as much as I can um, without burning. And then in the winter time, it used to affect me much more. I uh, I remember the, when I first went keto in 2016 in March, I, I felt amazing within weeks and mentally much stronger. And um, my mood was kind of high and even in a way that it, it hadn't really ever been. And I got to kind of September, October, and I started to really worry because that's where I'd got into trouble before. I would kind of realize that I was in a depression and uh, I was feeling more anxious and I didn't want to see people. And in 2016, that just didn't happen. It was It was brilliant. And so I think a lot of it is to do with the food we eat. And, you know, it used to be that uh, everyone or every child would be given a big spoonful of cod liver oil uh, chased down with some orange juice because the cod liver oil didn't taste very good. And we've stopped doing that. There's a generational skills gap in taking care of ourselves. And I think people aren't eating enough food that um, contains vitamin D and preserves vitamin D. Um, and so I think we actually don't cope very well with um, seasonal depression where we are. And furthermore, in you know Glasgow compared to, say, any other post-industrial northern town in the United Kingdom, which has similar kind of uh, problems with post-industrial unemployment and all of that um, kind of social socioeconomic uh, misery that that can bring and negative health effects, you know, drink, drugs, and so on. Glasgow has this thing called the Glasgow effect where um, the life expectancy is even lower than you might expect from a similar city, similar size, like, say, Newcastle or Liverpool, um, with the same kind of socioeconomic problems. And I think part of that may be because of the the extra um, lack of, of sunlight. So I personally find that I feel better if I... Um, eat keto and mainly animal foods and a variety at that. You know, I did an experiment in February where I just ate grass-fed beef and lamb, mainly muscle meat, but I did have some offal and um, very high fat, uh, probably like 80% fat plus. And um, I didn't feel at my best. So I, I added back egg yolks and I felt great. So there's definitely um, something to do with making sure that I'm getting enough nutrition across the board at that time of year um, to feel at my best mentally. But I also go on sunbeds. Every few days, I'll go on for a few minutes. I um, there's, there's pretty good literature on um, how strong the UV light is and the different bands, UVA, B, C, and these bulbs. And although they're not matched to the sun's uv spectrum um they can be used in small doses in a way that i think is definitely a calculated risk this is ionizing radiation we're talking about it's not not to be trifled with but if you go if i go on for a few minutes and i don't burn and i scoot down to avoid the high pressure kind of facial lamps and I've done my research on what the bulb is and what the 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 power and the the UV spectrum is for that bulb. Then I'm happy that I'm getting vitamin D synthesis in the skin, and I'm getting the nitric oxide benefits, the cardiovascular benefits. You can I can feel it in my in my mood straight away. There's a definite boost. Um, so uh, you know I do all of these things in the in the winter, and I seem to stave off the seasonal depression that plagued me for. Um, you know, best part of 
you know, 25 years uh, quite well, but I don't think I don't think many other people do, and and it's and it's characteristic of this part of the world, and probably the no, more northern states in America that people just don't feel good at that time of year mentally. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely something I noticed around here as well. Do you know the research on supplementing vitamin D in in kind of a, a oral form? Is that very effective for people? So I think um, there's some studies show. Uh, no effect and some studies show some effect I think um, like anything there's a sort of u-shaped curve of benefit to harm and people can take too much vitamin d I've heard of people kind of mega dosing and getting into problems with vitamin k2 and how the body handles calcium um, you know similar to the, the uv light you want to try to, you know, I think, look through things with a paleo lens. How did the bodies that survived millions of years uh, thrive? In what environments? Under what stresses? And, you know, if you can get close-ish to mimicking that, then I think you're giving yourself the, the lowest risk um, life you can. Um, and so. When it comes to when it comes to vitamin D supplementation, I think aiming aiming for around sort of four thousand IU a day and throwing in some vitamin K two seems like something that that people do very well with, and that um, that probably can't hurt. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the way I've looked at it. It seems like the research is kind of difficult to, to parse through like what's effective, what's not effective, what's snake oil, what's actually, you know, beneficial to people. And it does seem like it, it can be a very low hanging fruit that some people can take and some people can see benefit from as long as they're not overdoing it. Like I said, I really appreciate that opinion. Scotland is also very interesting, especially these days. They seem to be kind of leading the way in getting rid of animal foods. I know Edinburgh, I believe, was the first city that's like trying to ban animal foods completely. Do I have that right? Yeah, uh, I was a bit disturbed to see that. I think it's a really bad idea. You know, um, there's disturbing statistics on uh, particularly women being hospitalized for um, conditions which are strongly associated with lack of iron and other uh, nutrients which are found in abundance in red meat. I think there is something of a, a kind of contagion around thinking that this is settled science somehow and that it's the right thing to do. Um, and people end up in uh, clamped in a kind of virtue signaling cycle where they want to show that they're good people, but they, they don't quite know how. And they want to do it in a public way. So eating, not eating meat or eating less meat is something of a cultural meme around that. And I think it's easy political capital because it's you know, popular with a certain group of voters. It's not too unpopular with you know, lots of other voters. There's certainly... Um, commercial interests involved on some level, although I can't quite work out where because the sort of lab-grown meat and meat substitute industry is kind of collapsing in on itself at the moment. And um, I kind of hope that it stays like that, but um, I'm, I'm not against new technology. It's just that uh, if you have a machine or an animal like a cow, which actually produces high quality upcycled food for humans and its life is taken for that food but it's you know lived a decent life up till the end i just do not see the issue and um i think people should be free to um not eat cows but um i don't see any real benefit from um, you know, reducing it by policy, and I certainly see lots of harms. The thing is that there's great swathes of the world, the billion smallholder farmers in the world who rely on their animals for their income and their food. And in most of these places, they're short 
like actually deficient in uh, nutrition. And so to virtue signal in the West that we should be removing this from people in the West who, are, who, who have ample nutrition but are showing signs of deficiency when they uh, cut out animal foods and then saying that we should do that in places in the world where they're actually getting really, really sick on a large scale from it. I think it's just one of the, the stupidest mistakes that we could make. Yeah, no, I agree. It just seems like the more this ketogenic message is getting out there, the more people are trying carnivore, they're healing themselves in miraculous ways. It seems like the, 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 the opposite rhetoric just gets more and more and more ridiculous. And I heard recently somebody say, I really like this phrase, like if you tell a lie enough times, people will start to believe it. And it seems like the propaganda is just getting so much further away from the truth and has so little common sense in it. It's like the Tufts food compass that is like saying that branded cereals are healthier for you than an egg cooked in butter or something. It's just so preposterous. But I think if that message just keeps getting repeated, people seem to believe it. It's nuts. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've got a bit of a scientific background and I'm interested in reading scientific papers. What I've found since kind of starting to evangelize uh, around nutrition is that, you know, when I was just a sort of uh, standard physics nerd, and people were kind of interested in what was happening with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN or um, the gravitational wave group that I was a part of. I could tell them what was happening with it. But the idea that any of them would go and read a scientific paper um, was kind of preposterous. So I think, and I'm, I don't have exact numbers and I'm not sure if they exist, but my, my sense is that Maybe one in a thousand people will ever read a scientific paper in their lifetime. And that might even be generous because I think most people are satisfied just reading the Scientific American or uh, the New Scientist article or something that's in the newspaper that, um, you know, they politically agree with. And um, that'll be the extent of it. And I don't blame them. You know, we can't expect everyone to be experts in everything. That's why we divide labor. It just makes perfect sense. You know, we all want iPhones, but we should be expected to be able to build one. So the idea that we should specialize and trust experts is, is totally valid. But, um, you know, the that in itself can be corrupted. And so you end up with a system where there's all these competing incentives like money or prestige or, um, you know, a certain sense of power and um, control, um, particularly around your own reputation. You know, uh, if, if someone's attacking your work over the last 50 years, then you're going to want to defend that, you know, very hard. So there's all these competing interests and um, the you know you can always almost always find an expert at oxford who completely disagrees with the expert at harvard so what chance does anyone have except by reading the paper um themselves and making their own mind up or just and this is what mostly happens picking a journalist who votes like them and going with that yeah that's right well that is that is why we need people like you in this space. We need engineers, we need scientists, we need people to think objectively that are not from the medical system. And you certainly aren't. You were a scientist and engineer, a very, very smart. How, how did, I, I love your story. How did your story transition from being interested in, in science to then kind of drift into the health space? Yeah, well, um, I left school not knowing what I wanted to do. I actually worked in restaurants at first and um, and bars, and I was in kind of high-end restaurants and bars. I, I really uh, love food, and my mum was a great cook, and um, I still is, but I got into these restaurants, and it really broadened my horizons in terms of, like, French cooking or uh, Italian cooking, and, um, you know, uh, like Georgia Eid says, I haven't met a foodie yet who's not a food addict. 
And that was certainly true of me. I had an addictive personality, especially during the winter. I would sink into smoking a lot of cigarettes, um, drinking a lot of uh, any alcohol I could get, um, you know, taking drugs sometimes when I was younger and habitually smoking cannabis a lot. And then um, I ended up going to university to do maths and physics. Um, although there is a little bit of a side story there, I started off with English literature because, you know, I love books and, po and poems. But um, I actually found that dissecting these things like made the sort of patient die on the operating table, if you like. And I couldn't, I couldn't read a book for two years after doing a year of it. I, I thought I just want something with one right answer. And so I switched to maths and physics. But um, little did I know that uh, physics doesn't have one right answer, um, especially when you get down to, you know, the quantum level or the graduate level um, where you're meant to find the answer yourself because there isn't one yet. Um, and I, I did my degree. It was very difficult because I'd been quite unwell from a young age. You know, I'd had um, chronic anxiety, seasonal depression, um, ADHD type symptoms and um, I, I'd struggled with autoimmune problems all since I was a kid. And so when I got to do my degree, I started to take my health more seriously because I realized I could, I was much more effective at studying if I didn't drink as much, if um, I uh, ate a little better, not that I really knew what eating better meant beyond, you know, five a day and um, trying to, trying to not eat junk food. And there was there was definitely some benefit in that. Um, and I managed to get my degree, even though at times I still got quite sick and um, particularly during the winter, struggled mentally and me metabolically found that I was even in, in the sort of warmer months, um, struggling a little bit, falling asleep in the afternoon. I sometimes used to say that I got my degree between the hours of eight and 10 in the morning. That's just when I felt most effective. And um, and then taught English in China for a year and then came back and I was working as an engineer in a, in a laser factory. And my mental health was really up and down at that point. I started to get suicidal ideations when the anxiety just got so crippling that I kind of struck upon the idea that that was a way out. And the seasonal depression was still there. Uh, the um, autoimmune problems had kind of waxed and waned as they tend to do. I would have flare-ups and then it would calm down. I would collect autoimmune illnesses along the way. And then I decided to leave my job in the laser factory to start a PhD in gravitational wave physics. And I didn't feel good. My health was bad. I um, had the seasonal depression and anxiety worse than ever. I had dreadful brain fog. My supervisor could see that even though I had a good degree in physics, I wasn't operating very effectively. And he had healed his chronic fatigue syndrome ME um, sometime before by changing how he ate. You know, it was a, it's a really great story. He was um, Professor Ken Strain. He, uh, he's been on my podcast a couple of times. And he, um, he was in his early 40s, uh, senior lecturer in gravitational wave physics and um, Glasgow University, part of the worldwide collaboration to find gravitational waves. Very smart guy, uh, lived by his wits. And in his early 40s, he got really, really ill to the point where he was bedridden. He couldn't really walk for a bit more than about 50 yards without collapsing. Um, dreadful brain fog. And he was basically told, like so many people with chronic fatigue syndrome ME, that there's nothing they could do and he probably wouldn't work again which was obviously devastating. But he came across Good Calories, Bad Calories, the book by Gary Tobbs, and implemented a low-carb diet. And then six months later, was running 10Ks again. And developed this side interest in nutrition research that was really deep and extensive and continued to be a physics professor. And so fast forward 10 years or so, when I arrived, he saw that I wasn't functioning very well and he didn't tell me what to do, but he would say things like, you know, 
wheat isn't food or nobody should be eating margarine or I only eat once a day and it's mostly meat. And I just thought, <laughs> what is going on here? You know, these are concepts that just had not penetrated at all, except in the, in the odd article I would read about, you know, it's position people as some kind of freak if all they ate was meat and that they were going to die young and all the rest of it. It was just such a fringe position. And, he's, you know, I would ask questions and he would say, you know, go to this blog like Hyperlipid or there's a couple others which are defunct now. There's Zero Carb Zen, which is still going, which is great. Um, go into PubMed and just search these terms and see what you think yourself. So I did all that, supplemented a bit, implemented the keto diet in March 2016, having dabbled a bit with paleo the year before. And within weeks, problems that I'd had for year, years, for most of my life, um, just melted away. So gut problems, you know, all starts in the gut, uh, you know, lifelong um, problems with uh, acid reflux went away, pain in my esophagus went away. Um, the my mood was high and even, my energy was high and even, um, the brain fog left me. Um, I I was able to function again, and it felt like such an amazing gift. So I'd, I'd been ineffective do, on my PhD funding for a couple of years, and you only really get sort of three years, you know, funded to do lab work and then and then kind of six months to write it up. And so I'd kind of run out of time. You know, I tried to do a a bit more of the lab work, but I'd also, like Ken, developed this massive interest in why this had helped me so much. And so I was reading all the time about that, just soaking up information, reading as much as I could, reading blogs back to front, all these papers, talking to people. Um, there, there was far fewer in the space back then. You know, Georgia Eads' blog was brilliant. Um, there was a few people who were researching it. David Unwin was active but not as vocal um and i've just watched it grow over the last seven years and i knew in 2016 i would have to help people the way i'd been helped because not everyone's like ken and not everyone's like me they're not going to want to read all the blogs back to front they're not going to want to understand science from the first principles they just want to know what works and sometimes top level couple of reasons why it might work and a lot of people want support you know i'm a kind of self-teacher quite self-reliant on it and i only need a certain amount of support for me to i'm kind of shameless you know i don't mind that i, I go to people's houses and say i oh, know it's okay i don't want to eat that thanks some people, that's really hard. And so I've been trying to translate what works and why into a, a sort of scalable solution that can help people for the last last seven years or so. That's amazing. I just, I, I love that story. I, I see this so often in this space that somebody's doing something completely unrelated to nutrition. But once they find this, they get so fired up. They will even change their careers. Like they'll do something completely different because it's so meaningful to them in their life, they have so much more energy that then they can't shut up about it and they want to share it any way that they can. So I absolutely love that. Can you explain to our audience, what is it scientifically that makes a ketogenic diet better, not just for our bodies and our physical health, but our mental health? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's plenty of conjecture about why mental health improves so much um, on a why it can improve so much on a ketogenic diet. And, you know, the, there's things like um, in, inflammation, um, oxidative stress, uh, using ketones as a, an alternative fuel source are three of the main ones that people talk about. And how those mechanisms interact with the individual so that, you know, if you're talking about something like chronic fatigue syndrome ME, like what, Ken Strain had. You're really talking about chronic fatigue syndromes. Similarly with schizophrenia, you're really talking about schizophrenia as, you know, there's a certain subset of people with schizophrenia who um, 
respond brilliantly to a gluten-free diet. And then there's people who just don't. You know, there's people like Amber O'Hearn, who were, you know, she was on a keto diet for years and years and wanted to lose a bit more weight, had heard of carnivore, tried it. And it was only when she did that that her bipolar went into remission and has stayed there for years and years. Um, so there's, there's really a mixture of theories about why ketogenic diets help people's mental health. And there's more and more anecdotal evidence about what mode of ketogenic diet and exactly how it's uh, used can help people's mental health. But there's no, there's not much settled science. I would say the most advanced is the research on, um, on epilepsy, you know, where ketogenic diets have been used successfully and safely for a hundred years or so. And I think it's interesting that, um, you know, people like Georgia Ede, Chris Palmer, uh, and epilepsy experts might look at a ketogenic diet and say, for a third of people who try it, it works really, really well. For a third of people, it might do something, but it isn't a silver bullet. And then for a third of people, it doesn't seem to do very much. And clearly for the first group, it's life-changing. You know, you have stories abound of people just turning their life around from a condition that they thought was basically ruining their life forever, because that's what they've been told, to living um, joyous, joyous lives again. You know, it's just remarkable. It's brilliant. So probably most of them aren't even kind of concerned about why it works. It just they're happy it does. I'm kind of more interested in a sense on who doesn't it work for and why like your amber o'herns like people who try a ketogenic diet and realize that it's only when they have above a certain amount of fat particularly non-ruminant sorry non-dairy ruminant fat that they really feel mentally good um the people who maybe go low carb but keep things like gluten in there you know is there something in that? I think the 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 relationship between um, gluten and mental health is fairly well established. That um, uh, you know, I, I feel like anyone who's got a, a, any issue with their health just should leave gluten completely out of the picture. Yeah. Um, and you know, the the, the and a huge issue with dairy as well. Um, the way that ketogenic diets are typically positioned is. Um, that you just keep keep starch, grains, sugar out of the picture, and increasingly people are saying you know stay away from industrial vegetable and seed oils, which I completely agree with, but also that um you can have as much high fat dairy as you like, and I think that's a misstep because I think for a lot of people, particularly around mental health, dairy can be a huge problem, not just because it seems like the peptides from the dairy proteins themselves can directly seem, maybe cause some kind of inflammatory cascade and it's not completely understood, but the presence of the peptides in the, in the bloodstream can, can, um, are implicated in severe mental disorders um, and mild mood disorders, the whole spectrum. But that also people find that there's, food addiction issues around dairy um, and food addiction is a huge component of uh, how people interact with their food, how they think about food day to day, how they feel about themselves, how they feel about their weight. So it is a mental health issue, even if it's not causing some kind of um, diagnosable mental disorder. So it's, it's actually a really broad question, I think, and there's lots of facets to it and kind of annoys people when I say, individuals have to find out for themselves. But I think there's no, the, the gold standard is a, is a very strict elimination diet and working out the best of your ability where your baseline 
best performance is with a diet. And then and I think that's why carnivore is so, so popular is that it typically is high fat carnivore is typically um, a great baseline for people. If they don't do really well on that, then um, it's, it's not clear to me how, how well diet, how much diet can help them. So um, sometimes when I've worked with people, a, a high fat carnivore diet helps somewhat, but it doesn't give them the, the relief of a mental disorder that they're looking for. So then we, we can start looking at what's worked with other people with supplements, for example, because supplements can be very helpful. You, you spoke about vitamin D3 before, but um, you know things like magnesium, zinc, and the B vitamins can be key in helping people to, to feel better mentally. Um, toying around with macros, like I say, sometimes jacking up the protein can make people's weight better and make them feel good about their appetite and so on. But very often, it seems that increasing non-dairy ruminant fat is the key to people's mental health and satiety and, um, and weight control. And other things like um, making sure you're getting enough uh, dietary choline, dietary zinc, you know, so if you, if you can, having shellfish and uh, egg yolks and, and these, these types of foods that, can, that are your nutritional powerhouses and really working out intuitively what it is that you really want at that time because it can change for the individual from day to day, week to week. And I quite like encouraging people to, you know, once they get on top of any food addiction issues or compulsive eating issues, to be able to go around the supermarket and kind of look at a food like a mount, like a mountain goat, you know, let, you know, risks life and limb to lick the walls of a particular cave where there, there's salt that they want for the minerals. I think you can go around the supermarket and you can look at what's there and think, do I want that today? And it's remarkable. One day you can really crave something beef mince and you eat a kilo of it. And then another day it just doesn't interest you at all. And you want to eat fish, shellfish. Um, and, and I think that kind of intuitive eating is, is something that can be really positive for mental health. So I think, I mean, I know that's a long sprawling answer, but I think keto for mental health is, um, is a, it can be a tough nut to crack. Yeah. Well, okay. I agree with you a hundred percent about the intuitive eating. I think you earn the right to achieve true intuitive eating when you've changed the diet sufficiently to where you're not intuitively eating, you know, all of the ice cream and all of the crackers and cookies. Once you get past that, I totally agree. Like you, one day you might crave salmon. The next day you'll think salmon looks disgusting. One day liver might look good. The next day you might not want liver and you might not want it for months. Like your body knows. And I think that's a great way to approach it. Once you change the diet, go see what looks good, what sounds good, what feels good. And I do believe that changes. I love what you said about dairy. And, and look, like I, the part about carnivore and being a nutrition coach, I hate that part personally. I don't like to be the one that says, you know, fruit might be problematic because of fructose. Vegetables may be problematic because of oxalate. I don't like to tell people that, you know, dairy may be problematic. I, I, I just don't know. But I have a client who was eating mostly carnivore, doing endurance sports. She was doing okay, but she was including cream in her coffee. And it ended up being quite a bit of cream. And she, she loved it. And I didn't want to be the one to say like, look, maybe you should look at that. You may want to decide to eliminate it. Sure enough, last month, she decided to eliminate it. Her mental health is way better. She lost seven pounds in a month, just like that. And again, it's frustrating because I don't want to be the one that seems like I'm taking everybody's like fun away by suggesting like, don't have the chocolate, don't have the plants, don't have the gluten. But if, if you don't do that all out elimination diet, like a carnivore diet, you'll never know. You'll never know how good you could feel. And that's certainly been your experience as well. Can you tell us how your journey evolved from a ketogenic diet over to a more carnivorous diet? Yeah. So like I say, Ken Strain was uh, approaching a carnivore diet when I first um, became his, his graduate student. But it, it took me a while to get my head around that totally. Um, my first 
proper elimination diet in, in March 2016 was based on um, posts on the on the Hyperlipid blog. So Peter Dobomilski, who's been on the podcast a couple of times, he um, has been writing this blog for nearly 20 years. And it's amazing. It's really about investigating using fat as a, as a fuel for humans. Um, and it's very deep and kind of, you know, there's some posts that I share all, all the time, which are, which don't need particular depth of knowledge. And then there's some like the legendary protons thread, which take you right back to the origins of life and why um, ultimately saturated fat is, is, is so exquisitely suited to human mitochondria and so on. It's just like a real powerhouse of, of information on human physiology, particularly around metabolism and fat. So um, you know, uh, thinking about thinking about the 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 posts on there, um, I started with an egg yolk ghee cream diet, and I was using a erythritol stevia sweetener, and um, because I was pretty convinced that erythritol doesn't interact too much with metabolism. So that was more or less all I was eating. There's not much dairy protein there because with the ghee, the dairy protein is more or less taken out, not completely. Um, and the cream, it's very, it's very low in the dairy proteins. And so um, I, I felt good doing that. Um, and that was my baseline, if you like. And then I started adding in uh, red meat again, checking if there's any issues. Things with histamine. I think at the time I did have an issue with histamine and um, it induced a certain brain fog and some irritability. I think I've got much better at that as I think potentially I've I've healed my metabolism somewhat. So I'm just more able to, to handle high histamine foods. Um, fortunately, because they're delicious a lot of the time. And I would reintroduce sort of higher protein dairy. And I really, really struggled to accept that there was a problem with dairy. You know, I was, I was really in denial. And um, I, I, I quite happily accepted the stuff about histamine, um, but I just didn't want to believe that when I was having cheese, my mood tanked, felt uh, kind of numb emotionally uh, uh, or, or down in the dumps um, or even anxious. And, you know, this is a strange, uh, sad coincidence that, when I ate blue cheese, I felt blue. You know, there was there was a there was a one to one correlation, and um, yeah, the, the, you know, uh, actually scared me a little bit when I was doing those experiments because the red meat experiment coincided with the cheese. It wasn't as clean as it could have been, and I didn't feel as good. So it did take me a little bit longer to go full carnivore, even though I'd read about zero carb zen and listened to Ken Strain from the beginning. Um, but I, gr I gradually moved towards that kind of in and out of keto using vegetables and having um, su sweet sweetened keto treats and um, this kind of keto ice cream, homemade keto ice cream, um, just kind of back and forth like people do and settled more and more towards an animal-based pattern just because that's what made me feel better and this intuition which takes many iterations for people who have an addictive problem with food um, until I settled to the stage of stop I stop fighting I stopped fighting the fact that the things I was addicted to didn't do me any favors except to satisfy the addiction in the moment and what am i left with uh fatty red meat fish sea, uh, uh, shellfish eggs beef dripping as a fat source um high quality pork by that i mean heritage breeds that ideally are raised without being fed corn and soy occasionally poultry i just don't like how they're the their um their fat is um typically high in linoleic acid, polyunsaturated fat. But that's where I've settled to. And it's just it's take it's taken a long time and 
um, some degree of acceptance and, and even, it's a strong word, but even grieving for these foods that I kind of treated like old friends and crutches for a long, long time. Yeah, they do seem like old friends, but they're not that friendly to you when you indulge them. And, and you think you're kind of assuaging the monster by feeding the addiction just a little here and there, but all it does is just totally make it worse. It's like throwing gasoline on the fire. Yeah, so, so pushback that I get oftentimes is that if you eat a carnivore diet, if you eat a lot of animal products, it's going to be cost prohibitive. It's going to be very, very expensive. I just today in my hockey locker room, one of my hockey buddies was like, how are you able to eat like 10 to 20 eggs in a single day? Eggs are so expensive. I tried to explain like they, they've, they've gone up. They're more expensive than they used to be, but it, this is very inexpensive. I spend a few bucks a day on my food and I am very happy and satisfied all the time. You uh, in the past have wrote, written a book about how to keep this stuff in, in, inexpensive. What, what would, what do you respond to people who say that this way of eating, this diet is cost prohibitive? I mean, it depends on what people's budget is. I acknowledge that there's people who are really struggling financially who um, can't, they just can't budget enough to, to have more than, you know, say a few eggs a day where they're relying on, um, on a government subsidy to, to just allow them to keep the lights on, to keep the heat on through winter and to pay their rent. Um, I know that there's a section of society like that and it's, it's really sad that that is the case. I don't think we're necessarily aiming this message at people who are in that sad situation, even though we want to. So um, I think the pushback that you get from about that group is, um, is reasonable, except to say that, well, shouldn't we be trying to make everyone healthier? In which case... I would be in favor of subsidizing high quality animal foods for people who don't have enough money to, to buy it. But if we're talking about people who are deciding how to spend their money and they think that the way that you and I eat is prohibitively expensive, then I kind of cry foul because I see people spending money on um, things like uh, wine or alcohol and it's maybe five 10 pounds a glass for, for uh, a nice wine. Um, that is a couple of days food budget like this. You're blowing on a single glass and I'm not judging. If people want to do that, go for it. But the idea that the very nourishment which gives me, which, which gave me my mental health back, which gave me my passion for life back, isn't worth um, half a glass of wine a day is absurd, totally absurd. I love that. What a great answer. I absolutely love that. You are somebody, like we said earlier, who is out sharing your message. You started Paleo Canteen in 2017. You wrote the book. Um, you know, your podcast is wonderful. I love it. I don't miss an episode. I think you do a wonderful job. I told you off air, you do a great job of asking deliberate questions that are very thoughtful, that elicit really great answers. As, as a fellow podcaster, that is something I I unsuccessfully <laughs> accomplish all the time. I, I ask kind of winding questions, say um too many times. You do a great job with all of that. And I, I purposely left out your new project with one of our other former podcast guests, Dr. Rachel Brown. Can you update us on what you have going on today? Yeah, for sure. Um, but first I would say that I would disagree that you're unsuccessfully doing it. I think it's a very welcoming space where you're asking uh, insightful questions. So that being said- <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, Rachel and I, both in Scotland, she's a consultant psychiatrist in Edinburgh, uh, an emergency, uh, sorry, critical care psychiatrist. So she deals with people who are um, in an acute mental health crisis. And we became friends, um, kind of bonding over the fact that we eat in a similar way. She's a carnivore and kind of near carnivore. And uh, we noticed incredible benefits to our health we kind of lament the fact that all around the world, but, you know, particularly local to us in Scotland and in the UK and in Europe, um, metabolic health is as bad as it is anywhere, pretty much. And we wanted to do something about it. And my passion is mental health because, you know, as a subset of metabolic health, because of the profound effects that 
had, had uh, happened to me. And um, Rachel obviously has worked in that space for a long time and sees the the despair in people's lives and sees the the ruined lives and the and and the lack of a hope that um, traditional therapies really bring to people. They can put people back on their feet. They can um, keep people um, away from the worst. But she's not seeing the kind of uh, remarkable turnarounds that. Uh, so that people are seeing with a change in diet and lifestyle. So we put our heads together and came up with um, a coaching service, which is what our new venture, MetSci, is. So um, it's short for metabolic psychiatry, and it's based on the principles of metabolic psychiatry, which have been kind of um, pioneered by people like Georgia Eid, Chris Palmer, Shabani Sethi, and... That is that if you get your metabolism squared, um, then your mental health is bound to have a, a much stronger platform from which to move forward. So it might actually be that you get better and you go into remission. Um, but it might be that you you have lots of, of trauma or other stuff to work through. Um, but why wouldn't you want to be in a healthier place from which to, to deal with that stuff? So. We really believe that um, people need high quality information that cuts through some of the, the bullshit and the snake oil that's out there. And also sometimes levels of support that just don't exist for people with mental disorders um, or mental health issues. So, you know, people can go on to metsci.com and they can, um, they can learn about why this should work. They can, they can receive uh you know, a free download that lets them explore this idea that metabolic psychiatry can be very helpful to their mental health and they can work with us. So they can, they can work one-to-one -one with me as a coach. They can do small group sessions worldwide. They can um, sign up for membership. And what we're going to launch later in the year is both an app and a course, which is called Mental Power, which will give everyone the information that they need and eight weeks of support every week so that they can join in, they can compare notes, they can get that support from myself and Rachel, and they can really hone down on what it is about diet and lifestyle that can help their mental health because it can be very specific. Like I've spoken about, it's not just about saying, here's a modified Atkins diet, you're going to be, you're going to get better. You know, it, it needs tailoring sometimes. So, that's what we wanted to do. And um, it's been very exciting over the last few months because there's definitely a resonance about it. People really are saying that they need this service, whether that's doctors who want to recommend it to their patients or whether it's individuals who are saying, this is what's missing, is a source of high quality information and support that will empower me to, to do this. Yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. I talked to Rachel at the end of last year, I believe. And, you know, she, she told me about the nature of her work and with the critical care that she's providing, you could tell she didn't have the time or really the ability to communicate, the, you know, how important diet was to somebody where in that, they're in that like a critically acute kind of situation. And, and you could tell it kind of bugged her a little bit. It, she lamented the fact that she wasn't able to reach other people. So I just think for somebody like her, it must be wonderful to, you know, work with you to create a platform where you can help people. You can coach people and provide that support. That just must light her up completely. Yeah, she's dead excited. And, you know, she, she uh, actually did manage to talk to a patient about using a ketogenic diet. And this woman was very unwell um, at the start of the year. Rachel was really concerned about her and um, she went on a ketogenic diet and um, she seems to be doing really, really well. So this is someone who had, she was in Rachel's critical care. Uh, you know, it, it, it was very, very worrying. And now she's got her life back. You know, that's the, that's the, the level of change that Rachel's seen firsthand from her um, metabolic recommendations. And that's something that I've found with, with clients as well as the turnaround can be swift and remarkable. Um, and that, that kind of leads me on to the sort of um, warnings that have to come with uh, 
with engaging with Metsai and with a ketogenic diet for mental health, which is that um, it's such a power, it can be such a powerful intervention that people have to work with their prescriber if they're on prescribed medication, not just like how David Unwin recommends for diabetics of any description who might need to taper their meds quite rapidly, um, which is a good problem to have, but still has to be done safely. Similarly with psychiatric medication, tapering is uh, an art and a science and people have to work with their prescriber sometimes more than once a week to really be careful that they're um, getting the right dose of what they're on because people can get a little worse before they get better. People can get better rapidly, but if they're taking a ketogenic diet as a, a therapy, then it can be powerful enough that um, their drugs need to be adjusted on a rapid time scale. Um, also, people who are in critical care, people who are having a mental health crisis, medical, uh, medical attention is appropriate. Coaching, probably not. So we ask people before they engage with us, if they're going through a mental health crisis, then they really need to speak to professionals in their area um, who, are, who are able to, to work with them medically. And if people are kind of acutely suicidal, then coaching isn't appropriate. So within these guardrails, we want to work with um, you know, clinicians and, and clients who, who want to get better. That's phenomenal. That sounds like such a phenomenal service. And I appreciate you going out of your way to say that people need to be mindful about stabilizing whatever acute situation they have and working very closely with professionals because, yeah, those, those medications might need to be adjusted very quickly, like you said. I, I want you to, if you don't mind, address somebody who, you know, maybe they're thinking mental health is kind of on, in the back of their mind. Maybe their parents are suffering with dementia and maybe they're noticing some things in their life. They're, they're not bipolar. They're not, they don't have schizophrenia, but maybe they've got the brain fog. Maybe they're forgetting names. Maybe they're forgetting phone numbers or just simple things, directions. You, changing the diet is tough. Carbohydrates are addictive. They're very good. They're tasty. I can't have any. I don't have any because if I have some, I'll have them all. And, and that has been difficult. It's been a difficult journey to, to get rid of it, but it's been so rewarding, especially for my mental health. I do not suffer from the same anxiety that I had before. And for me, that is worth it. For other people out there, they might not be ready to take those steps and, and to commit fully to like a you know strict carnivore diet. How... What would you want that person to know about how to get started? Yeah, I mean, I'm the first person to acknowledge that there's a cycle of change where there's sort of pre-contemplation where people just aren't interested in changing. And I tend to just leave them there because um, the, um, the, there's only so many hours in the day and some people are just not interested. I accept that. Then there's people who might be contemplating a change. They don't know exactly in which direction. Maybe that's the type of person that we're talking about here. And this kind of um, uh, threshold that needs to be crossed between the amount of pain that they're suffering day to day versus the pain of giving up foods that they are really attached to, but that might be able to uh, assuage the the other type of pain that they're feeling. Um, when that kicks over and above, that's when they make a change. And so um, when that threshold is crossed, and so I guess another potentially another way of, of, of thinking about this is what can you say to someone and what do I say to people just to try to push it over that threshold and plant the seed? And that would be, um, try it and see what you think if you try it for a month or two and it doesn't do anything then you've tried it and um you uh you, you, all these foods that you you you, you eat all the time they're still going to be there just because you stop eating them for a couple of months it doesn't mean that they won't be there if you want to start eating them again and that i think to a lot of people feels like a challenge it feels like you're saying um, maybe you can't do it. And of course, you're not saying that, but they might imply it to themselves. And honestly, I feel like um, 
that sometimes is as as good as you can do because persuasion is sometimes paradoxical. I think that um, being the change you want to see in the world is enough for some people and they'll just copy you and they'll ask questions naturally. But if someone is on the fence, then uh, being too forthright about it can just put them right off. So it's a really tricky one. And I think it depends on the individual. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. It's unfortunate because it's those people that are kind of in the middle that I want to reach the most. It's the people that are suffering with brain fog or they, they have low level anxiety. They don't even realize that they have. And I want those people to know that, that they can get on top of this and they can get on the other side of it, but it doesn't, you're right. It's, it's not hard enough for them at that point. It doesn't suck bad enough. And I'd look at somebody like Amber Hearn. We've hosted her a few times on our show and, she, and I met her in person a few months ago and she's such a sweetheart to imagine the version of her that would be bipolar and not the current iteration of herself it makes me sad but she had to get to that extreme point to be able to accept such an extreme diet and she can maintain it forever but i i i, I hope more people find you and and find dr brown and find this amazing message because mental health is it, it's deteriorating it's not going the right direction and people are really suffering and i think a lot of them don't even know how bad they're suffering and how much better it could be by changing their diet and you are such a wonderful example with everything you've done in your life the the way you fixed it and the way you've completely transformed your career to share that message i think is so wonderful i just really appreciate it i really appreciate you i love your podcast can you tell our listeners where they can go to find you and connect with you in your work yeah thank you very much that's very kind um it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh i'm most active on twitter at ali transforms a-l-l-y transforms um i also have my website with rachel metsy.com m-e-t-p-s-y.com and my podcast is the ali houston transforms podcast and you can get that um on youtube or all the usual places and um yeah, I, I I just really appreciate you, uh, you you know having me on and um, what you do to get this kind of message out there. Well, thank you very much. You're doing the same. Please don't ever stop. Keep it up. We need you. We need the scientists. We need the engineers. We need people to think out of the box and and be really forthright and share this message and think about things scientifically. So appreciate the kind words. Feel the same about you. Keep it up. It's it's fantastic. And thank you for taking time out of your very busy life to chat with us today. We really appreciate you. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Ali. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.